I am your host, Tony Hawk, and we are here in Vista, California, north of San Diego, on my own personal private vert ramp. This is actually the Boom Boom Huck Jam touring ramp that ended up here, and so we ride it regularly. Uh, I'm here with some of the world's best skaters, and we are doing our best to stay within all COVID guidelines, and so you'll see everyone is wearing masks. We are staying six feet apart on the deck and we're trying to be as safe as possible while giving you enough entertainment. So let me introduce who we have here. Over on the decks, right across from me, is Sky Brown, uh, one of the most famous young skaters today uh, on the Olympic team for Team Britain, and uh, an aspiring, well, aspiring, a ripping vertical skater in her own right. Uh, next to him is the legend Annie McDonald, uh, multiple X Games champion, vertical rider, uh, my doubles partner in all those times you might have saw us riding at the X Games, and uh, still ripping. And uh, oh, to his right, or to his left, is Mr. Bucky Lasik, another vertical legend. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, he's been featured in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, and in my opinion, still one of the most progressive riders out there, and you'll see why in a little bit. Uh, over here, we have, I guess, our newest pro, what, in my opinion, one of the best ever, Jimmy Wilkins, um, who will show you what it's like when you're young and you can fly around without grabbing your board. Um, and uh, next to him is Kevin Staub, another legendary vert skater. Uh, he and I grew up skating together literally since we were 11 years old, and we're still doing it to this day, and we're real, real old now, but we can't quit. We never grew out of it, what can I say? Uh, here to my right is Miss Lizzie Armanto, another legend, world champion, park and vertical skater, Team Birdhouse. And uh, this is your crew, so it's stacked. And we're gonna take you through the history of vert tricks in the beginning of this whole session, which really, how did these tricks come to be? A lot of these tricks were pioneered in pools and on ramps and then taken to the street. You'd be surprised at how many of the tricks actually were developed here on ramps, on vertical realms. Um, and uh, it's, it's really an interesting journey. We're going to take you through some tricks, and then we're going to do an open session so everyone can show you, you know, their best stuff. And uh, we're going to interview the future Olympians here, Lizzie and Skye. So let's get started. Um, vertical skating started in empty swimming pools. And a lot of you might know of the Dogtown and Z-Boys era, but that whole movement was surfers who discovered skateboards and wanted to emulate surfing on waves. And then there was a whole drought in the 70s in California, and they started skating the empty swimming pools because they resembled waves. That is how vertical got started. And these guys would, would skate the pools, and they would carve around them, and then they started trying to figure out how to get to the top of the pool, and that's when everything really exploded. And I'll show you some examples here. Uh, anyone want to take this? Annie McDonald? Uh, yeah, so basically the idea was that you're, you're, you're going up the wall as high as you can and doing in what we call kick turns and, and turning. And uh, it all looks very simple now, but back in the day that was the best. And then they started to reach the top and grinding. So that became the thing to do, is to try to hit your truck. And to them, that was the height, that was the biggest you could go. Anyone else got tail taps? T Jimmy's got tail taps. I love how I'm gonna pick the, the most, the newest school guy with the oldest trick. And so this became the trick to do, was sled, balancing on your tail on top of the coping in pools. That was the ultimate back then. But they wanted to keep going further, obviously, and then people started doing what we call rock and rolls, and they would tap the bottom of their board, Lizzie. They would tap the bottom of the board and turn 180 coming in. And that was their way to dance on the top of the, of the lip, which kind of opened up them to standing up on top of the deck. So the progression from a rock and roll was to do that going in the front side direction. And honestly, that was the very first difficult trick I ever learned as an unsponsored amateur and what got me recognized and actually eventually sponsored. So I'll show you what a frontside rock is. That trick was invented by Eddie Alguera and he was my, uh, he was my inspiration at the time. And so I had to learn his trick, and um, it's still considered kind of advanced. But uh, from that point on, people started to 
explore getting into the air. And that's when everything changed. And that's really when I got into skateboarding, what inspired me was seeing people flying. And the evolution of aerials was that these guys were doing, the skaters were doing these kick turns. They were getting as high as they could. They were actually getting on one wheel. Anyone want to show me an edger? Andy, edger. So they get on one wheel right there on the very top. And then at some point it became, what can we do after that? And then came the front side air. So as the, as the skaters, it's debatable who created this, but that was literally the first type of air right there. It was a front side air because I believe they thought that it was easier to go front side and see where you're going because it was more emulating surfing. But that was the first aerial ever done, was a frontside air. And then they took it to the backside direction. Uh, Sky's got that. <laughs> the early grab, yeah. And so they would actually grab the board early and get into the air. And that was the very first backside air. Things started changing very rapidly after that. As, as people were doing aerials like that, uh, there was a skater um, in Florida, his name was Alan Gelfand, and he figured out how to do, Kevin, Jimmy, Front Ollie, he figured out how to do an aerial without grabbing the board, known as the Ollie. The very first Ollie was done in a pool, was done on a ramp like that, not, not on the ground as we all come to know Ollies, but that was actually the very first Ollie ever done. And when he did that, it changed the game. When people realized you could lift off in the air without grabbing your board, it was a huge moment. And I was a young skater, super skinny, super scrawny. It was really hard for me to get to the top of the ramps because I just didn't have the bulk or the strength. But I realized that if I started doing Ollies into my aerials, that would allow me to not have to reach down early and to keep my momentum flowing. And so the first trick I ever did that I was known for at the time was an ollie to in the air. And I'll show you what that looks like. And that is how people basically do airs now, is ollie into them, because that's how you can use all of your speed going up. I did it because it was kind of my way of cheating. I didn't think I was creating a revolution. If anything, I was actually made fun of for doing that at the time, because the older skater said, well, Tony Hawk cheats. He can just ollie and grab his board every which way. And I was like, isn't that OK? And you'll see now how we can do all kinds of different errors. Anyone can take this one. So here's Sky with a big melon backside air. That's the grab behind the back foot, behind the front foot. And there's a stale fish. And a front side air. So stale fish, if you want to know the folklore of stale fish, it was, I named it because I had just learned that trick today and someone grabbed my diary at the skate camp and they read stale fish and they said, was that the name of that trick you made up today? And I said, no, that was our lunch because we were in Sweden and they literally serve a stale fish. So, that's how it got named. Um, there are all, all kinds of different eras. Should we cover those too? Bucky will cover some. Oh, there you go. There's a one footer. Judo air. Lean air. Lean air was named after Neil Blender. And tail grab. Tail grabs are hard because you have to you have to launch out much further than usual because grabbing your tail actually kind of pulls you back towards the deck. It's just a little hint for you. And here's Annie with a slob air. And the roast beef. Ooh, there's a lean air walk. So the roast beef is actually a stale fish but grabbing between your legs. And um, Kevin Staub was one of the creators of that. Oh, Lizzie's going. We all got airs. Whoa, double grab. There's a double grab. So if you, if you grab the nose and the tail, we call that a cannonball, because it looks like you're doing a cannonball off a diamond board. 
Um, okay, so uh, once people started doing, figuring out that they could do aerials like that, they started exploring what else is possible. And one of the things that they figured out was that if you put your hand down during an aerial, you could pivot, you sort of use that as your central point and pivot around it. And that became what's known as the hand plant. Once they started doing that, there was a revolution of hand plants, what we now know as inverts. But the first hand plant ever done, Kevin will show you, was grab me between the legs, with your hand on top, and that was the basic, in, what we, call, we now call an invert. Um, the, uh, go ahead, Lizzie. <laughs> and then another skater came along named Dave Andrecht, and he grabbed the outside of his rail because that was his method or his preferred way to grab, and no one had done it that way, so that became known as the Andrecht. Um, another, t another tidbit is uh, another invert that people like there are people know about it's called the layback air, which is kind of a more easier invert because you don't actually get upside down doing it. And some people say it's it's not pretty, it's not cool, but I'll show you what a couple layback airs look like. Or the layback, roll around. That trick is known as the Todd twist, because a guy named Todd Joseph started doing layback like that, and we all thought it was the coolest. So that trick is still debatable whether people like it or not. I don't care, I still do it, because I'm from that era. Uh, another example would be different types of hand plants. That's called a Smithvert, because Mike Smith did it just like that. That's called a sad plant, because uh, there was a famous skate spot called sad, Sadlands, and Lance, Neil Blender or Lance Mountain had a picture doing an invert like that, and so we said, that's a sad plant. Um, Kevin will show you what it's like if you go front side. And then front side invert. Um, those are, there's so many different ways of, of doing that. Uh, there's also what's known as the Miller flip, and that's a front side invert 360. Did Miller flips come first? I think so. Maybe so. Named after Daryl Miller. Here's a Miller flip. My front side inverts are terrible because I learned that first. Um, another example of an invert, this came much later, it was called an eggplant, and that's using your front hand as the, as the handstand hand. Um, a lot of people prefer that. Jimmy, you want to do an eggplant? <laughs> I think Jimmy prefers eggplants. Yes. Do you want, do you want to do a stale egg? Yeah, okay. Okay, so Lizzie has her own signature version of that called a stale eggplant. It's a hard grab. Wow. That's pretty amazing. You got to see that live. Stale egg. That's a treat. Um, okay, so uh, that covers a lot of the different inverts. Fun fact is the very first 540 ever done in a pool on a skateboard was actually an invert. It was a front side invert pushing off into a 540. We call it a unit. I'll get to that later. I might try one, but it might not work. <laughs> um, and then uh, once people started figuring out the aerials, it was like, what can we do with aerials? What can we do while we're in the air? Um, one of the very first board maneuvers ever done is called a varial. Um, it's named after Eric Grisham, who at the time rode for Veriflex skateboards. And he figured out how to do an aerial while spinning his board under his feet. Um, he was going in the front side direction. And uh, I was a young, impressionable kid at the time, reading the magazines, and I could not figure out how to do a front side varial. So I learned how to do it backside. And um, it was actually the very first trick I ever invented. And this is a backside varial. Uh, I still can't do front side variables. <laughs> so then, 
from that point on, it was like, what else can we, how else can we maneuver the board? Um, kick flips as a trick were not invented yet, either flat or street or whatever. Rodney Mullen obviously is the creator of the kick flip, and he wasn't doing that until the mid 80s. So the only way we knew how to flip our board was to do it with our hands, and that's called a finger flip. And Bucky, I'll show you an example right now. Wow. <laughs> and so that was literally the first board flip ever done in the air or on the street. Um, and uh, then fast forward to late 80s is when people started learning kickflips because obviously Rodney Mullen created it. They wanted to take it to the vertical realm. And now there's all kinds of different kickflip variations happening. But who wants to do kickflip? Andy McDonald. Flip Indy. And a Nolly heel flip. And I'm going to guess a Nolly heel flip front side. There you go. That was a time machine, a time capsule of, of <laughs> kick flips and heel flips. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, that, that's kind of when there was no limits as far as we were concerned. It was like people are starting, you know, you can move your board, you can kick with your feet. Uh, what else can we do? And then uh, it, started to, it started to move towards spinning and literally spinning your body. So uh, not just 180, but up and down, but like 360 or 540. And the very first 360 aerial ever done on a skateboard was no-handed, and it was the Cavill aerial. Steve Cavill aerial figured out how to go fakey, uh, fakey, and then 360 backside ollie, and come in forward. And that was before anyone had even done it grabbing. So I'll show you what a cowboy looks like. So there was a whole group of skaters. They were trying to figure that out, me included. And they could not figure out how to keep the board on their feet. And so they started grabbing it just as a precaution, uh, which became the cab mute grab. And that was much more popular because it was easier to learn. Anyone got one? The thing about those is that you can actually do them much higher. And it's a starting point for some other tricks, including tricks like 720s. Um, so the first, oh, why did I do this to myself? OK. The first 540 ever done on a vert ramp or on a, in a pool was what I said. It was a front side 540 hand plant. And what happened was it was Billy Ruff. He learned how to push his hand off in the first part of the, of the trick and use that to keep his momentum going and to keep him off the wall. I'll try one. There's no guarantees I'll make it. That was a unit. I haven't done that in like five years. OK, that was the first 540 ever done. Then Mike McGill, fast forward about four years later, Mike McGill was at a skate camp in Sweden on a much bigger ramp than anyone ever skated. And he started exploring backside 540s. And he figured out how to do it in a full flipping motion. One and a half somersault, way above the coping. And that became known as the McTwist. The McTwist revolutionized vert skating as we know it. Anyone got a McTwist? Actually, how about a frontside five? Oh, no. no? I just did a unit. The next, the actual, the first 540 without using your hand was that trick I just did without putting a hand down. And that was a frontside 540. There you go. So that was, that was literally the first 540. Um, it didn't really catch on. Uh, I learned at Del Mar, but it was hard to get consistent. And then Mike McGill came up with the McTwist. Who's got, oh, you want to see Jimmy's McTwist, trust me. Sorry, Jimmy.
There you go. That was a big ass 540 right there. That, that's a McTwist. Um, there are other variations of McTwist. Melon grab. Any takers? Looking at you, Andy. There you go. So there's there's melon grab, there's indie, there's stale fish, tail grab, cannonball. We got varial. We got the works. Um, uh, let's see. Around 1990, I started uh, jokingly trying to do McTwist without grabbing my board, and I would go up in the air, and my board would just fly away immediately from my feet. And then at some point, I tried to do it a little bit lower, a little bit lower, and then I found that I could keep my board on my feet if I was a little lower and carving it, and I actually figured out how to do a 540 without grabbing. Ollie 540, um, it was, it's one of my favorite tricks just that I've done, because I always felt like it was, when I was young, I thought that was an impossibility. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to someone who has actually mastered the trick, Jimmy Wilkins. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to watch, so enjoy. Sorry. Had to do it. Look at that. So, you know when people say they see you skate, they're like, how does the board stick to your feet? I usually have an answer, but when I see him do that, I don't have an answer. I don't know how the board sticks to his feet, because he's this high and he's not grabbing it. So, that brings us up to really modern vertical skating. Um, there's all kinds of variations of all those tricks we just did, even more than I explained. And, um, sorry. And uh, I think now we want to just show you sort of what we do and, and putting all that stuff together. So we're going to session, kind of jam session here for a little bit. Um, but first, I want to talk to <laughs> the future Olympians and get a feel for what that means for our sport. So. Uh, I'm going to talk to Lizzie Armanto right now, over here. Okay. Um. Okay. So, uh, um, I'm really curious. I know you're, you're on Team Finland mm -hmm. for park skating. And you started <coughs> skating at a time when skateboarding was not even considered for the Olympics. Do you, I mean, did, did, you, did you think it was even a possibility when you started skating? I definitely didn't think skateboarding going to the Olympics was like in the cards, like at all. Right. Like when I first picked up skating, it was just like something I did to take up time after school. and. I kind of, I feel like it kind of like, I fell into it more so. And fast forward, like, I ended up really liking the whole scene and like getting into competing and stuff. And I don't know, all of a sudden it's like the Olympics pops up and it's like, oh yeah, we're taking skateboarding. And I don't know, that's so crazy. I mean, there's a bit of right place at the right time, but I, but I definitely have seen you push harder knowing that it was coming um, and go, going to way more events than usual in the last year. Uh, in preparation for what would have been the Olympics next month, right? Um, but how is it now that it's on pause? Does it make you relaxed, or do you feel like I gotta work even harder? Now that it's postponed, I feel like, I don't know, I have more time to like kind of get ready for it, and I feel like I'm just taking this time to like, I don't know, feel good on my skateboard and keep continue to push myself like I would be doing, and I don't know, taking things as it comes. But was it, was there some? Was there more anxiety when you heard it was postponed, or was it just all right? We're gonna do it next time. Next I don't year? know. I kind of feel like I'm. I have more time to mentally prepare. Like mm -hmm. if anything, it really felt. It felt like it come came up so fast. Like I don't know. Yeah, the qualifying was was uh, intense, challenging. Yes. Yeah. Like <laughs> I don't know. Skateboarding's so uh, kind of chaotic, and yes. watching them like throw it into the Olympics with all like the organization like intended like needed to like do something like that. It's just been like such a, a process watching it yeah. kind of and materialize. To be a yeah. And then yeah. trying to like get through all like them getting over like the hurdles of like even just like making up the rule book. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm excited for you. 
and Team Finland. Yeah. And so, uh, congrats. You're still on the team, right? I assume. Yeah, everything's, everything's all the same. It's just like next year. Next year. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Lizzie. Thank you. Um, and next up, the newest Olympian, uh, Sky Brown. Come here, Sky. Joining us. Thank you, Rad. Um, I can't believe how quickly you have recovered from your injury. By the way, she broke her wrist. Uh, it seems like only <laughs> weeks ago, and you're already back on the ramp. So, thank you for for your passion. <laughs> um, speaking of that, what was it about skateboarding that made you follow it so passionately? It's just I've been telling, well, like I've been telling girls to never give up, and I want to show that. So that kind of made me want to keep going and. I don't know. I honestly wasn't. I was just more excited to get back on a board. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of when you first started, what was it about skateboarding that drew um, you in? Well, I don't know. I guess it was my favorite toy. Oh, okay, that's that's yeah, good. Yeah, my dad would skate every day. Yeah. He had a back. He built a backyard mini ramp. Mm -hmm. So he would skate every day with his friends, and I would always steal his board and like get on it. Oh, that's <laughs> so you were just drawn to it. Well, that's awesome. That's how I mean. That's how my kids started skating because because I was doing it and they just picked <laughs> it up. Um, so when you heard that uh, skating would be included in the Olympics, did you consider that you actually might be able to qualify and participate? Yeah, well, at first I didn't really believe it. I thought it was kind of like a joke or something, but yeah, I... But I mean, you heard that and you had been competing off and on. So was there something that clicked that, oh, I might actually get to be on one of the teams? Yeah, I was definitely, I was like, oh, maybe. And I feel like that's a good place to show everyone that mm -hmm. you can do it too. So that's maybe, that's what made me want to go harder and get on it. Well, you're, so you're going to be on Team England next year? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what about the delay to next year? Was I'm, that, are you, did, did, was that scary for you or was it like, okay, I'm more fired up? At first, I was definitely, definitely a little bit sad. You know, I felt like my, dreams are going away, like I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but now I think about it a lot. It just gives me a longer time to get better and I just, just gives me a longer journey. Mm -hmm. So I just gotta enjoy it and try my best. And it's gonna be fun to see all the girls get new tricks and see. see yeah. yeah, yeah, you too. Well, <laughs> well, good luck, you'll be at Team Thank England. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Cool, all right. Well, Sky Brown, future Olympian um, and uh, Thanks for being here too. Thanks for Thank showing you. your stuff. So we're gonna let these guys loose and, and show you what we do for a little bit. Enjoy. Oh, she, uh, Wow. 
Whoa. How are your wheels sticking? Oh, you hear that? Yeah. Did you hear it twice? I forgot lip tricks with plants. I know. We're gonna stop, we'll stop, do that. All right, hold on. This guy. time I was like please don't slide out yeah oh
like that trick these days. That is so hard. You just saw something real difficult right there. Front side blunt slide. Keep watching him. <coughs> oh! Bucky's pulling out his signature moves. Impossible tail grab to nose bash. Wow. Woo! Yeah. We all had to be put on the spot somehow. <laughs> yeah. Japan Air. Once I fast plant over the gap. And drag. Wow. What is going on? Andy, contest run. Gold medal X Games run right there. Yes. Yeah, let's see. Yes. Go, Sky.
Yeah. Get it. Yeah, Kevin. Watch Bucky. Make it. Oh. Hey, hey, hello. What's up? Uh, we are live. I am going to take some questions from you guys um, in, <laughs> in this strange scenario. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. From Paul's, uh, hold on. Sorry, I can't hear anyone in my ears, so. Hey, Bucky, you got that uh, impossible? Do it. I'll film up with this. Oh, wow. Did everyone see that? That, that's the ender right there. That's the hammer. That, that like end, end scene, close, cr closing credits. But we're going to do a Q&A here. Um, I cannot hear anyone in my ears. But if you guys uh, type questions, I can see them. Oh, there you are. Hey, what's hey, up? Buddy, can you hear me? Hey, yes, yeah, I can I hear you. We're on mute. <laughs> oh, Who's How is everyone? <laughs> Good, how are you? Oh. <laughs> cool. Do you have any questions? Yes. 
Karthik, do you want to go first or should I go first? Uh, yeah, you can go first, man. Go for it. All right. Thank you. Tony, uh, pleasure meeting you finally, a childhood hero, so to say. I even thank had you. your birdhouse deck when I was a kid. Oh, thank you very much, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I had a question. I myself, I'm, I'm an Olympic pole vaulter, and uh, right now, still training for the Tokyo for the next year now, I guess, if it's going to happen. We'll see. Uh, maybe the corona is going to keep going on. And the uh, question for you, I think for many athletes, is how to overcome fear and when you're thinking a lot of it, thinking about the trick or the thing that you want to do and execute, and uh, don't get that thinking in your way of just actually doing it. I, I honestly, I think it's about confidence. It's about confidence and experience. And if you can believe that, that you're capable of all the pieces to do something that you want to accomplish, then it's just a matter of actually doing it. And the biggest hurdles are your, your fear and your doubt and if you can at least tune those down <laughs> and and keep your confidence level up you can make it happen but i but i believe if you are trying something and you are considering the worst case scenario or worried about the things that can go wrong that's what's going to happen they're going to go mm -hmm. wrong and so when you're in a position like what we're doing we know we have the foundational skills to to get something done and it's a matter of just putting those in motion and not hesitating. Thank you. I hope that helps. Yeah. Hey, Tony. Cool. How are you? Hey, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So uh, as a competitor, um, did you ever struggle with being content after accomplishing uh, so much? And if so, like, how did you deal with that? Being content? Yeah. So like, so uh, I, I think I have I have issues with never really being content with my performances. I always feel like there was room to improve. Even if I had gone to an event or and won it, I felt like, oh, I could have done this trick instead or I could have gone a little bit higher. And those are just the kind of issues you got to deal with if you're on a, comp a professional competitive level. But uh, I think I've learned in my old age to be more happy with my performances. Um, especially considering that I am much older and it's like, I could still do this at my age, I'm happy. But it took a while to get there and I don't wish that upon anyone to be tortured like that when you're coming up uh, in, in your field or when you're even on top of your field and you're not happy with it. Okay. Learn to enjoy I the ride. <laughs> appreciate it, thanks. Thanks. Hey Tony. Big fan hey. here. Uh, me and my brother grew up playing pro skater. Uh, that was a part of our childhoods. Um, I had a question for you. Um, if you could put anything on a billboard for the world to see, uh, what message would you write on it and why? Wow. Um, my message would be to respect each other. And uh, don't, I don't know, don't make assumptions of, of people or their, or their backgrounds or their motives. Um, and if we could just have a little more empathy, I think <clears throat> we would all be getting along much better. And, and I think we'd at least be much further along in, in this strange pandemic era that we're in. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, some empathy goes a long way. That's my billboard. <laughs> There's Love a lot it. of fine print in there. Cool. Hey, yeah. Hey, man. Um, big fan. Uh, I'm actually moving right now. I just pulled over on the road to see some. <laughs> I see that. Um, That's amazing. Now, uh, yeah. Where uh, are you moving to? Um, in San Francisco, moving over to Southern California, Palm Springs. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we were just there surfing the wave uh, pool two days ago. Oh, it's already built. Nice. Uh, it's it's in the testing phase. Nice, nice. Um. Yeah, so heading out, and I think like with many others, there's a lot of transition right now. Um, so like I kind of like followed your career. I know in the early 90s, there was a lot of change for yourself and like maybe some doubt in the sense is like skating going to really take off. Um, so kind of like would like to hear your thoughts on like transition. This is a weird time for a lot of people. Um, what are you and like maybe the skate community doing right now? Because I think a lot of people are picking up hobbies like skating BMX again because they have a lot of downtime. Uh, I well, I agree with you there. Uh, in fact, our, our sales for skateboards 
have never been better in the last few years because people are taking it up again or, or trying it for the first time. It's been this strange silver lining to everything. But I think in terms of moving forward and staying positive, it's, it's really just trying to do things that can benefit others, maybe learn some new skills, um, and take, just take inventory, take priority of, over what you want in your life. Um, but it's hard, you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't, I don't want to discount that at all. Everyone, everyone's struggling in their own way. And if you don't have the job that you had, um, it doesn't mean you can just turn into another one. But if you really are willing to lay down the groundwork and learn new skills, it'll take you somewhere. I mean, I've learned all kinds of things having a skateboard business that I was not interested in as a kid or even as a young adult. And uh, I embraced those challenges, and I learned them, and it benefited me along the way. Cool. Thanks, man. Thank you. Good luck, and enjoy your move. It's hot out there. 120. <laughs> yes. Hey, Tony. Uh, as with everyone else, I was, I'm a super big fan. Uh, I had a question uh, specifically. So you've contributed a lot to the sport, but one of the main things about sports are awareness. And I think one of the things you've done outside of the immediate sport, as someone else mentioned, was creating your Tony Hawk games, which like so many people got into uh, skating that way, or at least played the games as a childhood. Can you share some thoughts on like, you know, how you got into like what the idea behind that or like how did that come about in the first place? Uh, I was shopping the idea of a skating game around in the mid 90s with a PC developer and we just kept coming up against a lot of pushback. Uh, uh, video game publishers, console manufacturers, they just didn't think skateboarding was a viable option. It wasn't popular enough. So he kind of gave up on the idea. But um, luckily, because I was pursuing that, Activision had been working on a game that they weren't telling anyone about. And they called me and they said, uh, hey, you know, we are working on a game. Would you want to be involved? And uh, I went up to their offices in Santa Monica, saw a very early version of what became Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. And I knew it was the right fit. I knew they had really good direction, good, uh, good engine. And with my help and resources, we could make it much more authentic. Uh, I had no idea it would be a huge hit. I just thought that skaters would like it. Um, and it became, it really became one of the, the, probably the most successful things in my life. Big reason that I'm here talking to you. And uh, we were remastering the first two 20 years later. So, uh, yeah, it's so it's coming ride. out soon, right? Uh, yeah, well, the demo, the warehouse level demo is coming out August, 14th. what is it? 14th. 14th. And then uh, September 6th is the full game. Thank you. All right, thanks, man. We have anyone else out there? We do. <laughs> I'm not used to holding a So we a have a tablet. question. Selfie. Hey, what's can, up? Sure. Can you talk of where you're hoping skateboarding will go now that it's sort of been included in the Olympics? We've seen, we're in Colorado, and we've seen a huge, like, explosion of snowboarding after it's been included in the Olympics. Are you hoping for the same thing with skateboarding or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I'm excited for the international growth of skateboarding and the idea that countries that probably didn't have any support or didn't give any support to skateboarding are now going to step up and build facilities and maybe, and, and maybe even pay riders or train skaters. Um, I think that's the silver lining. I don't really, I, I don't have gr great big hopes um, that, that uh, skateboarding is going to explode and become the next basketball or whatever. I, you know, we like that we've kind of been on the fringe. And so I think that the Olympics are going to give a lot of um, validation to people who have who devoted their lives to it and opportunity for careers. 
and uh, opportunity for a travel. I mean, you look at someone like Sky, she is growing up in a generation that just knows the skateboarding is a part of the Olympics, and I think that's amazing. But um, other than that, I just, I just hope that we get more skate parks. That's, that's the goal for me. Okay, we got three more. Who else is there? <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little hot here, sorry. We're in San Diego. All, right, all the skaters that were featured today, will they be in your game? Um, a couple of them. Bucky Lasik will be, uh, Lizzie Armanto. Nice, I'm ready and, to unlock uh, I hope I hope that we get to remaster more and we get to include more. Cool. I'm looking forward to that game, really. It's been Thank too you. long. Me too. Thanks. All right, we got two more questions. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, I might go for it. <laughs> I had another question. Is there going to be any guest sequence with you on a jackass on the next one? <laughs> Uh, I hope so. I did, I did have that conversation recently with the director. They had to put their filming on pause from COVID, but they do want to start up again when they can, and uh, we are trying to figure out some way for me to be included. So, fingers crossed. <laughs> I hope I survive it. Let's put it that way. Oh, true. Thanks. True. <laughs> hey, Tony, a uh, quick question. So, you know, just, just like uh, Gunna and and uh, Jimmy, I'm also looking forward to the next game coming out soon. Uh, but due to COVID, you know, people have more time. I actually bought a skateboard today and I was looking to pick up a new hobby. Uh, would you recommend going to like a skate park or just like kind of figuring out how to like, you know, like get, get used to the board just around the street? Uh, I would just get used to turning it, uh, controlling it, the, getting used to the feeling of motion. Uh, before you go to a skate park, mo not, not because of the skate park, but because you don't want to be in danger of others. That's really the key, because there's, there's a certain flow and uh, cadence to skate parks. And if you have never been to one, it's very likely that you're going to be going to sort of against the grain. So learn the basics, learn how to control yourself, learn to be comfortable, and then go to the skate park. I okay. recommend showing up early because that's when the little kids are usually there learning. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I don't want to be a stage hazard. Yeah, you'll be fine. All right, appreciate it. You, you look young enough that you, you could, you're at a good age to start. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I hope, uh, hope you all enjoyed, enjoyed our yeah, instructional. Uh, last question. Uh, oh yeah, go for it. Uh, how tall are your ramps? This ramp is uh, 14 feet tall. It's got a 13 and a half foot radius, two feet of vertical at the top, and then it's six inches off the ground. Thanks. And that gap right there that you're looking at is eight feet across. All right. Thank you. Yes, thanks everybody. Uh, I just wanna thank all the skaters, Sky, Jimmy, Bucky, Andy, Lizzie, Kevin, um, and uh, I want to thank Airbnb and the Olympics for putting this all together. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, 900 Films for being on the ones and twos, <laughs> as they call it. And uh, what can I say? We will see you in Tokyo somehow, some way. All right. See you later. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, thank, Tony. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.